Hi, I'm MC McAlee. I am the Director of Marketing and Community Relations for Berkshire Opera Festival. Welcome to Opera and Beyond. This is our third webcast and we are so pleased to have with us Will Berger. Now, if you don't know who Will Berger is and you love opera, you haven't been paying attention <laughs> because Will is on the forefront, uh, associated with the Metropolitan Opera as a producer, as an on-air personality. Uh, he has uh, authored f at least four titles and is just the dude you want to talk to when you want to talk opera. So welcome, Will. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, do you want to tell us a little bit about all of this stuff that you do? I work at the Met full-time and then some. Um, I am a writer for the media department and the press department, website, program, uh, radio, scripts, including some for myself, and I do on-air commentary for the weeknight broadcasts. And the quiz. And I write and produce the quiz, yeah. and I do features for the Saturday broadcast, which are fun and challenging and uh, intense. Very cool. Yes. Yeah, it is. I'm so glad you're here. Thanks. I am. to be here. Yeah. So what's interesting, I was thinking about, you know, some of the titles um, of your books, right? So Puccini Without... Excuses. Excuses. Yes, Puccini Without Excuses. Verdi With... A vengeance. a vengeance and Wagner without fear was my first so I was wondering what Strauss is going to be <laughs> um, I, I don't know I'm actually working on Mozart right now oh. which I've been avoiding for many years because I was intimidated by the subject yeah. and uh, I they got in touch with me and said let's have a Mozart book well um, it's an interesting lead-in to, to a certain extent um, we're here today to talk about um, our main stage production for the summer, Ariadne F. Noxos. Yes. Um, we Good choice. Thank you. Yeah, I think the boys did a, a nice job with that. Um, we've done two uh, webcasts so far. One was sort of a, an overall idea about what Berkshire Opera Festival is and the general scheme and plot of Ariadne and what we might be doing in this particular production. Our second one um, looked at the music of Strauss the tone poems, mm. the songs, and of course this culmination of opera. And so now we wanted to get a little more into the nitty gritty of Ariadne. Mm. And um, the reason I mentioned the lead in from Mozart is because I know that one of the motivations um, for Strauss um, was this idea, um, exploring this idea between sort of high art and low art, or opera seria and opera, you know, comique. And, and of course he felt that Mozart was very constrained um, by especially Opera Seria and so I don't know if you want to well, it, talk a little it bit about it is a that. great connection uh, Mozart, you cannot talk about Strauss without talking about Mozart right. Even he, Strauss thought he was working from where Mozart left off right. which might strike some opera goers as curious because you, you walk into most Strauss operas and see this orchestra of a hundred and uh, you're going to be there for hours and hours in the very big scale and you have singers who also sing Wagner and you think, oh, well, these aren't Mozart singers in many cases, but we have to remember that Strauss thought he was doing Mozartian work. And that's most apparent in Ariadne, not only with the smaller orchestra right. and this chamber idea, but also with the themes and the whole notion of what what is theater? What is opera? What's music? Um, and it was both very modern and very classical, what Strauss was doing in that wonderful way he had, almost uniquely, of being all things at the same time. Modern with a big capital M and classical with a big capital C and foofy, you know, the, the whole sort of Viennese Baroqueness of Ariadne is really important as it is in many of his works and yet is extremely 20th century at the same time. So all these things come together in Strauss in a, a wild way, in a, not even syncretic, in a, more, in a completely holistic but yeah. bizarre way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the guy was a fascinating person, and mostly fascinating because you'd think someone who'd write in that way would be this kind of erratic genius, right. and, you know, with a lot of the hair going this way and that way. And he was just, the most 
sort of commonplace person to right. me by all accounts. Right. And he really cultivated that idea of, no, I'm just a average a, Joe. Average Joe, and you know, I like my beer and brats and this sort of thing. And his wife was a, a quite a personality in the same way as, you know, no, I'm just a house frau. And, yeah, but she wasn't. Uh, and exactly. all these things. And it was on. funny, as a matter of fact, when we were putting together um, our second webcast about his music, of course, you know, <clears throat> we thought, well, we'll include biographical information. Mm-hmm. And then when we looked at the biographical information, you know, it was sort of like, yeah, he says so much more in his music, yes. you know, than he did in, in his living. You know, the other say, you know. person, I, I, I know you've spoken generally about Strauss, but yep. just to give a little yeah, let's context, do it. the other person you have to mention uh, in order to get a handle on Strauss, of course, is Wagner, right. because he was touted as the successor to Wagner in the way that Puccini was promoted as the successor to Verdi, which are both horrible mm-hmm. titles no one should ever have to live with. Right. Um, but in many ways, there, there were other connections as well, of course. Strauss's father was a, a musician in the Munich Orchestra, worked with Wagner, didn't like him, um, but there was just this idea of Wagner hanging over his head. So you also have to think of that, too. So we have nothing, as you mentioned, we have nothing to go by, thank goodness, in many ways, right. except uh, largely that he does have a biography and it does become an issue at later points. Yep. yep that's we'll all that. that. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but uh, we do have his work to go by. And we have Aria. And because of Ariadne, um, we have a little bit of information um, from his letters with mm. his librettist, Johann mm. von Hofmannsthal. Hofmannsthal, yes. Who, um, you know, this was their, well, we could say third, third collaboration way, I mean, yeah. at, the, at, mm-hmm. the, at that point. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But I mean, um, even and especially with Ariadne, um, it's just such a fascinating history, and when we see the back and forth with the two of them as to how it came about from the very first yes. incarnation, yes. Um, where they thought, where, where in a way, um, you know, Strauss, uh, you know, was introduced to this idea and kind of just said, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, not well, he always he always played that right. role. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay, I'm just a hack. Yeah, you know, yeah. If that's what you want to do. You're the genius. Yeah. Hugo von Hofmannsthal was very much the swooning artist, right. uh, cultivating that personality, very involved in the modernist with the capital M movements in Vienna at the time and previously, which puts him alongside such intellectual lights as Klimt in the visual arts, everything going on in interior design and architecture, thrilling things. Um, Sigmund Freud is happening. All this stuff is the milieu of Hofmannsthal very different from where Strauss is coming right. from. So, yes, this comes, Ariadne comes after they had done Electra, right. which was sort of a, a Hoffman-style adaptation of Euripides. Right. Uh, basically rewritten, but that's right. right. Um, and Der Rosenkabeling, this massive, massive work that I happen to be working on right now with the men, and you're right to bring up their correspondence because it's amazing. It reads like, it's a read. Yeah, it's exactly. an absolute read. Yeah. And if, if you're interested at all in process, in any of the arts or anything, you have to read the Hoffmannsthal Strauss correspondence. So he says, well, what are we going to do next? And uh, he turns to... Um, Molière. Molière, yeah, right. You know, what's his name over there, right. the Comédie Française? Hoffmannsthal had actually attended the play, right? Yes, and, Le yeah. Bourgeois Gentilhomme, and, uh, which, you know, is still done all the time in English and schools and everything. Uh, very brilliant play of Moliere. And says, let's work off of this and let's have a companion piece for this. And do you think, um, I mean, Hofmannsthal wanted to experiment with a new hybrid in terms of having incidental music for the play and then having an opera afterwards, I mean... Well, he's working with form, isn't he? Exactly. He's working with form, and that becomes an important part of our story right. in Ariadne. Right. But he's also working with the idea of what do we do with this, a classic from 200 years ago then. Right. Ish, right. 250 right. years ago. What do we do with it? Do we, uh, do we do it perfectly as it was? Do we read it in an academic sense? Do we try and... 
make it new, as people would be saying in a while. And they came up with this original conception, which, uh, now here we have a case where Hoffmannsthal's theories and ideas were very lofty, they always right. were, very refined, and the work that came out on the stage simply didn't work. Uh, because you have in, incidental music to the bourgeois gentilhomme, that's a long play. It's a classic French play. Everything has a motivation and a reason, everything's thought out, and it's wonderful. It's a complete work. All yeah. Right. And then the idea of topping it off with a <laughs> little opera entertainment, and again, this was something they did in the 18th century. I remember attending... The, com the combos, you mean? Yeah, and also little divertissement okay. sort of things. Right. Like, okay. we're going to get the best composer to write a little thing that'll be at the edge. You always have to think about who was the work written for? Mm -hmm. What were their needs? Mm -hmm. How did they experience it? Did they sit there in the dark as we do and pay rapt attention? Did they walk in and out and eat sorbets and flirt? Uh, and there many of these 18th century... Uh, little entertainments that were glommed onto other things uh, were very participatory. So that people would, your audience would dance at certain parts. If you had been in one of the, in the audience for whom it was written, you would have been given a little sheet of music for the chorus and you would have sung it. So you're, you're, you're participating in one of these entertainments. So when Hoffmannsthal wrote it for a 1912 European audience that was meant to sit there, it wasn't going to Very have the different. same effect. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing, not only that, he had devised this very interesting story. Again, we're playing with form. Right. And uh, just to describe it very briefly, the idea is we have an entertainment, uh, an operatic entertainment. We're going to have two of them for a very rich man. And there's going to be a serious opera and a comic opera. And then, because of delays with dinner, I think it is, and the fireworks exhibit, which is the important thing that everyone's waiting for, it is decided that both operas will be given at the same time. And so this very bizarre post-structuralist <laughs> idea of two operas going on at the same time as an addendum to Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme within another framework of an entertainment being given by a rich bourgeois uh, Jean Delon. right for right. his own glorification before right. his fireworks show this that was what the this entertainment this opera Ariadne Auf Noxus was right. it didn't make any sense so when they decide to revise this work which is not something he did with his own works very often right what they decide to do is to have a prologue, which will set out all these issues. Great idea. Moreover, they decide to set the prologue backstage at this opera. So you have this very sort of later 20th century deconstructed idea of theater within a framework, within a framework, and everything is within a framework, and everything is false, and we know that going into it. And so on and so forth. And it also allows them to... Semiology and signs right. and signifiers. Exactly. It's terrific. Without saying any of this. Under, and, under a circus tent. So to under, speak. Yes. Right? And within the framework of a comedy. Right. And it is. It actually That's another thing I love about Ariadne. With the prologue, it actually is funny. Right. And makes the comic elements of the opera within the opera, a uh, big framework here, uh... Also, not only funny, but a lot else besides. So, we have in the prologue only the composer, who is a very Straussian creation. Of course, it's, a, it's played by a mezzo-soprano, a woman playing a man, because Strauss. Be also, because on the deeper level, and this becomes an issue in De Rosenkavler and uh, other places as well, perhaps in Mozart as well, because Strauss, who understood the human voice, like very few other people understood it, not only technically, but what it meant. What it evoked. What it evoked. Right. Strauss understood that the voice is represents psychic truth and therefore has no gender. What a beautiful statement. <laughs> well, it's, it's why gender is fluid at the opera. Yeah. It's why 
every voice speaks for some part of me. Mm -hmm. uh, the soprano, the voice that will be heard against <laughs> all odds. It can cut through a, an orchestra of a hundred. Uh, Verdi knew how to do that too. The baritone being the voice that will I will probably be saying, well, wait a second, let's think about that. Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, authority, the father. One of the reasons I love to talk about Ariadne and get audiences engaged with it is because it's one of the very few operas that is frankly about opera. And it stands for opera, and right. it works with the things that make opera work. And I remember... Okay. And pokes fun a little bit, too. Well, it po well of course. Yeah, 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 it, yeah. It, it pokes fun and has great reverence, because right. Strauss could do this. Right. Um, and when we had the prologue backstage, we have the diva, who walks through and makes and kind of says a couple of things and goes into her dressing room, and that's all we hear from her. In in the prologue. In the prologue, exactly. Well, and then she becomes Ariadne. As the diva, exactly. As, and then she becomes Ariadne in the opera. Which leads me to a question: Is Ariadne even, even a character in the sense of, um, you know, a sort of human? <laughs> or what or, did you say? Is it human? Human. Uh, she just seems right. so much more important. Well, she's not. She's human. not human. Exactly. She's played by a diva, a goddess. Well, now wait a minute. Let's rewind. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Um, you know, diva is a word that gets thrown around a lot. Remember, a diva, okay. Okay. Opera has roots in religion, in Greek religion. Of course. Uh, opera, when it was invented in re post Renaissance Florence, was an attempt by academics and interested parties to recreate Greek drama festivals where the new music played a role. Um, and their genius was to do it in Italian, in their language, with their music, instead of worrying about how the Greeks did it. And that's why mythological subjects, Greek mythology subjects, have, were so important in early Italian opera and remain present. That's why Ariadne of Noxus is a Greek myth, because we're looking to the roots of what is opera. And when you say diva, despite what we do with the word today, you have to remember that this means goddess. Uh, and it points to the primal issue of what an opera is or can be. So when we have the diva, and she has no name, she's the diva, we have one character. Now who, then we have, of course, the comic lead, Zerbinetta, who is Zerbinetta backstage and, and Zerbinetta on stage. Right. Why she did is she the get the distinction? Opera. Correct. Right. Okay, so we not only have opera, but we have what's the difference between tragedy and comedy? And one thing we learned, this is a very handy lesson to know in, in opera. All comedy is realism. In that it takes place in real time. That's true in Mozart and De Ponte and these very complex issues of why is Don Giovanni a dramma giocoso and all that stuff. Opera is a manipulation of time. And the more high-minded it is, the more you play with time. And you think in the Baroque operas of Handel, where time stands still. You just hang. You're not trying to get done. We're going to repeat it one more time. All right. So Zerbinetta is the same person she is offstage as on stage. Because she's and comic. the diva is not. Yes. Okay. This is profound, mm -hmm. and it's it's. I mean, it's not profound to say. That's easy. It's profound to put into action and see how they work together. Mm -hmm. So when we have after the prologue where they explain that we're going to have to perform these two together, and uh, someone who is not a high-minded artist is going to have to make it work, which is that character. Um. The, the Strauss character, mm -hmm. uh, who we don't see in the opera, mm -hmm. interestingly. Mm -hmm. um, all that is figured out in the prologue. And then we have an, another interesting part where the composer sings maybe the most famous part of the prologue. It's this sort of hymn to art. Music is a, is a sacred art, which Strauss thought of as a parody. Right. He, uh, he almost... And yet people take very seriously, and it's very interesting. It, it's... You never know what you're supposed to be thinking. But it's also another reason why it's a mezzo-soprano. Not to make fun of it, but because it's otherworldly, right. if you do it this way. And therefore, it's the, it's, the parody is at 
the whole unearthly part of the artist who's mm. above earthly mm. considerations. Mm. Well, somebody's got to pay for this. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, this has not changed. So somebody's got to pay for this, and the artist has to figure that out. And don't you love this touch where there becomes a flirtation? Right. Very innocent and yet distinct flirtation between not the diva, but Zerbinetta, right. the real woman, right. who is not above being generous with her charms uh, with men, and apparently not only with men, and they have a flirtation there, a seduction, which I think is very interesting. There's a part of the high-minded artist that is flirting with the idea of reality. It also it it's gets the job done. It's charming, done. exactly. It gets and the it's job charming done. at the same time. So here we it go. It finds Francis a methodology yeah. to get the sublime yeah. uh, at peace with practicalities. Mm-hmm. Yay! Yay! What right. a beautiful and but I mean anyone can say these things, but to show them in action with music, which will dig under our resistance to it, and. A, a tremendous economy of music. I mean, we well, I was going to say, and that's already in the prologue too. That's so right. It, it, Thirty-six instruments it, in the piece. It, it, right, right. And it, it's interesting. We're this production will actually have the orchestra on stage. Uh, we great have, idea. Things having the orchestra on stage is great. I've seen Ariadne in very primitive, even conditions, and it works in a whole new way. Mm-hmm. And when you're sitting close to the stage and all this, it's terrific. I mean, I think you're meant to be. Yeah, I'm pretty sure of that. And our and our, and again, if you don't mind me speaking about our particular um, um, situation, the Colonial Theater in in in, in Pittsfield is uh, there's something about it that creates an intimacy, mm. a, a very special intimacy. It's not tiny, it's not huge, it's just right. And I think for Ariadne, we're gonna find sort of again that special magic that we found with Butterfly last season. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, we're really looking forward to it. So let's uh, let's continue our discussion. Let's get in there. Um, well, so they decide to make it work, and the condu- the composer decides he's going to make it work. Sort of under Zerbinetta's spell. Would we say guidance? Spell. Spell, spell yeah. is way better. Yeah. Um, and then, are you taking a break? Then we are. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have an intermission okay, at that point. That, that works. Yep. And then when you come back, you're in in the world of the two operas that are going to happen at the same time. So you're no longer backstage. What's happening? Well, real, really quickly, you have the myth of Ariadne, daughter of Minos of Crete, abandoned on Noxus by Theseus, the greatest hero, who she rescued from the labyrinth and the Minotaur at great sacrifice to herself and was taken away, and he dumped her <laughs> dumped her on this rock on an abandoned rock one of the earliest things we have in opera is a, a solo of Ariadne's lamentation how could he have left me very very universal and this um, whole idea yeah. of, of of her representing lament yes <laughs> lament loss abandonment right abandonment uh, absolutely. everything that's ever <laughs> happened wrong to women yeah, yeah. since before history and she then expresses these things in a way appropriate to the lofty eternal themes set out in Greek mythology uh, with solos and this sort of thing Uh, you need a great operatic voice uh, and very self-conscious not moving a whole lot there's not a lot of movement for Ariadne to do it's more of a of a sort of <clears throat> plant and thing. poised thing in a very Grecian sense. During this, and this is what must have struck the original version audiences is what's going on mm-hmm. here that the prologue helped explain. Zerbinetta wanders across, in many productions, she's able to walk across water that Ariadne is not because <laughs> it's theater water. And Zerbinetta's are. Zerbinetta, real person. She, she, hey, this is a stage here. It's not water. <laughs> uh, with her troupe of Commedia dell'arte performers, a uh, traditional Italian kind of uh, stock character, clowns, Punch and Judy sort of thing. Sure. So she and her friends walk across, and instantly you'll notice a change in music representing them, and things like a piano showing up. Right. Um, and 
then there is interaction and there is very interesting interaction between well, mostly between Ariadne and Zerbinetta. Ariadne, she doesn't really want to talk to Zerbinetta no. because she's the princess Ariadne, a half goddess, a diva. <laughs> and Zerbinetta is this cheap, you know, dancing Flusy. for the people, floozy, mm-hmm. uh, for coins. And, um, but she does interact a little more than she wants to. And she says, you can't understand, he was a god. Theseus, meaning the man who dumped me. When Zerbinetta is saying, oh, you got dumped yet? Terrible when that happens, so we'll find you another. <laughs> uh, because that's how it works, and you know... It's... And that's the whole premise of, of, of Zerbinetta's monologue. Zerbinetta's monologue, which is remarkable. <clears throat> uh, is. One of the most extraordinary pieces of music ever written, where she's trying to sound light and fluffy, and she should. If she does it right, you're not going to know that this is one of the most extraordinary pieces of music ever written. That's what we're going for. Again... This idea of like, no, I mean light and fluffy. Oh my God, how am I going to hit these notes? <laughs> with, complete with high Fs like Mozart in the music flute. Uh, but she's, she's basically saying to Ariadne, uh, man, yeah, well, it would be nice if, if you could keep them, but you can't, so find another. And then Ariadne tells her, you do not understand. He was a god. And Zerunetta has the priceless line where she says, well, they're all gods when we meet them. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a, a loose translation, but one I'll stand by. And so the struggle between these two ways of looking at things, it's cultural, it's sexual, it's, it's artistic, it's philosophical, it's musical. Because you have Zerbinetta's monologue, which is, what, 12, 14 minutes? It's about 16. 16, 16 yeah. Model. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Better her than me. But then you also yeah. have Ariadne's Sol as Keep Time High, which is, I don't know how long it lasts, which in itself tells us something. Exactly. Because time works differently in serious opera. So when she's singing about as Keep Time High, there is a realm, death. What is death but the place where time is, works differently? And so you get suspended in time. So you also have different measures of time going on at the same time. Again, you think this was written originally in 1912 in a milieu that would have included Albert Einstein. Right. We were who starting taught to us that, that actually there are variations in time. Mm-hmm. Scientifically, this is an artistic way of looking at the same thing. And what happens when you have two views of time at the same time? Well, you have a, an infinite view. Right. And that's among the implications of what you have in this charming little divertissement right. that is known as the opera in, uh, note, note the affected accent, in Ariadne mm-hmm. auf Naxos. Then, what should come along but a tenor? Well, so what's going to happen to poor Ariadne? And notice that we also have um, kind of sp- nature spirits who sing to her, Naiad, Dryad, and Echo, uh, who sing to her and console her. They don't sing to Zerbinetta. We're never really sure if Zerbinetta hears them. Who then say, hey, there's a ship coming. And she thinks, is it Theseus coming back or is it death? Is it death? And so... And, of course, is it death or is it a tenor? Because more, of the tenor. More. Okay, go on. <laughs> I mentioned the voices and certain yeah. things that they stand for. I don't yeah. mean to limit that, but there's... Yeah. The soprano voice expresses certain things very well. And, and you hear him... You not only hear this character, you hear him proclaiming himself not only as a god, uh, Bacchus, uh, the god of wine and many other things, the god who invented opera in a sense... But you also hear him proclaiming himself as a tenor, hitting these high notes from offstage yeah. that are going to bust a, a blood vessel easily. And so we're saying, okay, okay, here comes a tenor. What is a tenor? The tenor voice represents action, not the, vo- not the part of you that's going to say, wait, let's think about this. Mm-hmm. It's the part that's going to act. And you do that, you, that part of you is the part that makes love, because most of the time, if you think about it, there are more reasons not to, mm. and goes to war, mm. leads a charge. So you always, if you're going to lead a charge in opera, or you're going to say, no, let's make love here, right here, right now, no matter what the consequences so, so, are, the yeah. tenor voice represents that really well. Right, so, right. Uh, so he's coming in, he's going to change things, he, because Ariadne is stuck, and Zerbinetta mm. is doing her thing. So we hear this God coming, 
and he has just escaped from the enchantress Circe and finds Ariadne, who's this beautiful princess. She thinks he's dead. Because that's what she was asking for. She's never the only completely option. clear that he isn't <laughs> dead. Which is, again, very interesting. So he comes and he does what tenors do. One of the two things the tenor voice does best in the opera, he makes love to her. He sings in a loving way, in a very passionate, erotically charged way. Um, and of course, there's a wonderful moment. It's one of these just rather subtle Hoffman stahl esque moments where something wonderful happens in the orchestra and she says, was that it? Was mm. that the crossing over point? Mm. <laughs> and she doesn't know if she's died or if she has had some sort of erotic fulfillment because they are the same on a psychic level. In one way or another, she is transformed or she does realize that she's transformed and she's surprised at how easy it was and how pleasant and she sails off literally into the sunset with him. Well, Zerbinetta, of course, has the last word to the audience, to the audience, because who's the audience and who's on stage at this point? And where she says, you see, they're all gods when they come to us. They're all, when we meet them, they're all gods, which is she suggesting that when they have to pay bills, they're gonna have a different relationship, or is she saying the cycle goes on and you fall in love, and maybe you'll fall out, but you can still savor this moment. And it's it's a message of hope, the, the continuation of life and love uh, against all odds, brought home to us by the comic, realistic woman, real woman of the, the earth, right. is a beautiful, beautiful message, I think. I agree. Um, and it's a wise one. It's not a, it's not a bromide. It's not like, <laughs> oh, life is good. You should be happy. No, no, no. Not it, at this all. acknowledges that things, yes, mm -hmm. that things are complicated and, you know, life gets to you and there is a longing toward death uh, that is part of all this. But it's still, um, things are born again constantly and that's a beautiful thing and doesn't that, I love that. and doesn't that address even still again the the lower higher absolutely uh, you know and they both keep renewing themselves exactly. over and over you just keep working with this art form and it will always be new yes and, always, and we found that to be true i mean as you were saying earlier you know in in that time and space in those particular sets of circumstances what they were exploring we're, we're still exploring Yes. Oh, and we will be forever. I thank you just from the bottom of my heart for, for talking with me today and, and sharing your, not, not just your great knowledge, but your great passion um, with us. Thanks for letting me. And, and bringing that beautiful, you know, bringing it home with that beautiful message. I can't imagine um, a better way to, to, to um, invite our audiences to be a part of it. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of it. Thank you. So uh, that wraps us up, and you will see more information about the screen about our next Opera and Beyond webcast. Thanks for being with us.